this uh, workshop is about uh, waste and sustainability and uh, it's from the guys of a very well-known bar in Paris, the R Little Red Door, from Alex Francis. And yeah, you know, it's uh, the top 50 bars and last year awarded uh, for the most sustainable bar. And this workshop will be sponsored by Discount Spirit, a company dedicated to uh, for sus sustainability. And I hope you will enjoy this workshop. There we go. So, thank you so much for joining us. Some of you I know, some of you I don't. Again, you have some garnishes. No eating them until we say. It's very specific. Um, lovely to meet you all. Thank you so much for Bar Symposium Cologne for inviting us back for a second year. It was our first year last year. It's part of our launch in Germany. So it is fantastic to be there. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Sam. I'm the global brand ambassador for Discarded Spirits. Apparently, if you scan that QR code, it will take you through to my Instagram. Not a shameless self-plug. And with me is also Alex. Hello. Uh, I'm Alex Francis, the director of bars for Little Red Door. Uh, yeah, like Sam said. We, we've put together a seminar on uh, seasonality and waste. Um, to be really honest with you, we don't have many opportunities to do things like this where we can stand next to a brand where we don't have to be very careful with what we say and how we say it. Little Red Door, as we will elaborate on, work in a very specific way, a very direct to producer way that does not always incorporate the interests of large brands. Um, that doesn't mean we can't collaborate with them, but we have to be very specific with them. And it's very rare when we present ourselves alongside a brand that we're able to do so without having to really cherry pick elements of their history or what they do. We can wholeheartedly present discarded alongside what we do, which is really wonderful. For those of you who don't know who Little Red Door is, we're a little bar in Paris. We're in Le Marais. Uh, we have been open for just over 10 years now. We've been incredibly fortunate by good luck and a little bit of hard work to be in the 50 best world bars nine times. Last year, we placed number five. Uh, we also won the Kettle One Sustainable Bar Award along the way, and we won the Tales of the Cocktail Award for World's Best Menu. We have no idea which menu that was for. They showed one picture of one menu and then drinks from another, and they never mentioned which. So it could be any of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is, to be honest, isn't that bad. They're all the same concept, which is part of three menus we put together called Grounded, which launched just after COVID, Flourish, which was available all of last year, and then this year, which is Evergreen, which some of you have in front of you. Please pass it around if you are able to. Um, yeah, we were known for conceptual menus. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of Remy Savage. He started the conceptual menu program within Little Red Door. That was taken on by Rory, uh, Rory Shepard, who then developed that into even more conceptual menus and more elaborate presentations and styles. And then uh, four years ago when I started, we started pivoting towards a farm to glass model, which we'll kind of elaborate on how that works and how working in that model allows you to create zero waste or low waste cocktails and essentially a low waste business from the ground up By, because this is a PDF, by the way, um, a lot of this is designed for if you want to look back at it, you have further information. So there'll be some bits we just skip through, which will be for later reference if you want to have a look. Um, yeah, this page just surmises uh, Evergreen, the latest menu in that series. This will be the final menu in the farm to glass series. That doesn't mean that we'll stop any of these practices or any of the way we work. It just means that we won't be ramming farms down your throat every single day. Me? Hello. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about who we are, what we do, and most importantly, why we do what we do at Discarded Spirits. It's great to be able to stand with a brand like Little Red Door because it's just so easy for us to talk about this stuff, which, again, isn't always the case. So, hands up if you know what Discarded is. Anybody? Okay, that's good. <laughs> Substantially more than when I did this last year. So, we've been in Germany for about a year, um, working with some of the amazing bars out there. So, if you have heard this, I'm not sorry, I'm just gonna repeat it. So, I'm just gonna touch on this one statistic because I think it's important. Like, we're all aware of the food waste issue, 
but this really hammers at home. And I think the reason we like to talk about this is this is why we exist. Like we are not a brand that was out there and then sort of started talking about being more sustainable. This is why we were born. We were born as a zero waste spirits brand and therefore we behave as a zero waste spirits brand. And food waste is preventable. Like you guys all know this, you can not put something in the bin. You can use it again, you can not throw out food. And so if we all change what we do a little bit, we can have an impact. I'm by no means suggesting that we are having an impact by putting liquid in single-use glass bottles. That would be ludicrous. But the impact we have is the people we work with and how we can shift people's perception on what waste is. And that's where it gets really interesting and really fun. It's really creative ground. So we like to say we're on a, vision, a mission to reverse needless waste. And we do that by framing a conversation using our three fantastic award-winning liquids. So our vision is that we want to pioneer the zero waste spirits movement, right? This isn't something that we can do on our own. The more brands that come out and change the way they produce, change the way they market, change the way they package, the more impact we will have. And that leads us into the mission of reversing needless waste. And our promise is that we want to show the world that waste tastes beautiful, right? I didn't even rehearse that. And everything we do from the way we make the liquids to the way we make the packaging to the way that we go beyond the bottle, cocktails, activations, events, it's all under this umbrella concept of reusing creatively. Like that is fundamentally what drives all the things we do at Discarded. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the liquids as we go through tying them into the drinks that, the, that Alex is talking about. I just wanted to touch on what we have. So we have sweet cascara vermouth, a banana pill rum, and a grapeskin vodka. You can see the awards up there. You won't recognize the Spirit Business Innovation Award from 2018 because that's really random. Um, but the big stuff up there is International Spirits Challenge, gold, last year. And the reason I really want to talk about this is it's very easy to get a bit lost in the eco story about these liquids. But in Discarded, we have this award-winning spirits made from discarded ingredients. And we don't nearly shout enough about just how fucking awesome these liquids are. Hopefully, if you've all tasted them, you'll agree. And that is something that is really key. Now, why I'm talking about this will become immediately clear when Alex moves on to his next bit, but packaging is a challenge, right? We are by no means perfect in what we do. There are some amazing companies out there challenging the way that we do supply chain, the way we do delivery. But right now, we're in a paradigm of single-use glass. If you walk into every single bar in the world, what do you see on the back bar? Glassware. So this is our attempt to innovate within that space and do something a little bit different. So this packaging is fully recyclable, every single last bit, and it's mostly made from recycled ingredients. Again, you can go through this and peruse at your own ledger. ledger. That's why it's in here. But there's a phrase I love from a zero waste influencer in America called Anne Marie Bonneau. She's at Zero Waste Chef on Instagram, if anyone wants to check her out. And she says, we don't need 10 people doing zero waste perfectly. We need 100,000 people doing it imperfectly. And it's this idea of progress, not perfection. Is this the perfect bottle? Obviously not. The perfect bottle isn't a bottle. This is a hilariously inefficient way of transporting liquid. Like if I asked you guys to break into groups and come up with a more inefficient way, you'd struggle. But how do we transport liquids in bottles. So I just wanted to touch on that before I pass back to Alex. Um, so the, this seminar talk, whatever you call it, will have a little bit of a different framework from how we normally talk about Little Red Door's farm to glass approach, specifically because we're putting it through the lens of the way in which Discarded tries to repurpose uh, byproducts and often overlooked products. And it gives us an opportunity to look at a part of Little Red Door that, like Sam mentioned, in terms of the award-winning part of Discarded, we don't shout about recycling and all of these other things because it's not central to our narrative. As a brand, our narrative is farm to glass and working with producers and championing them and putting them at the heart of our story and our con guest experience. But that doesn't mean we don't do any of it in the same way we don't think that we compromise on the quality of any of our drinks to meet that goal. We don't do the same way for our recycling side of it. And the key framework we use when we look at byproducts and waste streams within Little Red Door is these three channels. Does it still have flavor? Does it still have structure? Does it have neither? And we've created three kind of channels in which we work on that. 
most of which will be familiar to you, but we'll look at them through the prism of how Little Red Door works, because that might give you an understanding of how, the, like Sam said, small changes can accrue to greater change. Uh, this is one of those slides that I said we'll skip over. This is for people if you look at the PDF later on. And we'll put the QR code for those of you who arrived a little bit after. We'll put the QR code back up so you can download the PDF if you want. So this is Eloise. Uh, the first thing we're going to look at is pumpkin. For those of you who have your garnishes in front of you, there is a little meringue. Eloise is one of the most frustratingly talented people you could possibly meet. She is 20. She has four years farming experience. She runs one of the most awarded and recognized permaculture farms in all of the east of France, so not too far from here. Um, and she's incredibly uh, tech literate, which means she is an influencer. She left school at 16. Like a lot of people in rural France, she decided, this has no relevance to me. What will, how will this help me work in agriculture? I'm going to leave. She spent two years working on her farm with her father. After two years, her father went, you're better at this than me, keep going. Uh, and she uses her social media skills and presence to inform and educate both people in her age bracket and her peers, as well as other farmers who look at what she does and try to understand how can I engage with my community around me. We source from her, we say pumpkin. Pumpkin is actually a variety of different squashes. It's just very hard to fit all of that on one page. Uh, so you have petit marron, chestnut squashes, etc. We turn this into a mistel. So when we make a mistel, it is a distillate of pumpkin. So we infuse roasted pumpkins into neutral grain alcohol, which we will touch on a little bit later. We redistill this. We do this in a pot still. We work with a local distillery in Paris. Most of the things we do ourselves, if we don't do it with ourselves, legally someone else does it and we're in the room, basically do it ourselves. Um, once we've done that, we juice pumpkins and we blend the two together. Now, after we've done that, as any of you have worked with uh, squashes or anything like that, where you try and extract as much flavor, anything that's quite starchy and quite fibrous, it's very hard to extract all of the flavor without getting something that doesn't really look or taste very good. But there is still extra flavor in that. You can still taste it, but you just can't quite get to it. And so what we look at is we then look at how do we process that beyond to use it for other purposes. I think we should have pumpkin coming out now. Maybe, but I can't really. Anyone know where Leah's gone? It's gone? No, no, the drink. <laughs> uh, so it's the little meringue you have in there. I'll let Sam talk a little bit about uh, the banana peel rum that's in there as well. Just so you guys are all aware, all of the drinks that you just see described here are what we'll be serving later this evening and what you'll be tasting now. The versions of these that we have in Little Red Door don't use discarded in Little Red Door because it's not in France. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, so, yes. <laughs> um, so again, three liquids, award-winning. I'm just gonna talk really quickly about a banana pearl rum. I'm not gonna run through the whole slide. The information's there. The foundation for the way that we make all three of these liquids is you have a discarded base spirit and a discarded flavor. So in the case of the rum, the base spirit is, unsurprisingly, rum. It's a blend of three Caribbean rums, but it has a very unusual story. So you guys know the whiskey making process, right? We make the juice, we ferment the juice, we distill the juice, the juice goes in the barrel, the barrel goes in the cupboard in Scotland, typically, and then at some point we take it out and it tastes delicious. It's more complicated than that, but different barrels impart different flavors, right? And we're gonna come more onto something like sherry cask, which is what is used to season vast amounts of scotch in Scotland. But often a whiskey distiller will want to put a finish on something. So they'll take an unusual cask and put the whiskey in there for a short amount of time. Now, discard that is owned by William Grantsons, Hendrix, Glenfiddich, Barbenny, Monkey Shoulder, lots and lots of barrels in Scotland. One of the whiskies in our portfolio is a whiskey called Barbenny 14. Who's had Barbenny 14? Yeah, who likes Barbenny 14? It's great. If you haven't tried it, go and try it. The reason Barbenny 14 is special is it's the Caribbean cask. So it's 14-year-old Barbenny that spends six months in a rum cask. Now, casks need to have flavor added to them or re-seasoning in between the spirits resting in there. So what happens is we have a very special blend of three fantastic Caribbean rums that goes into the barrels between the whiskey. Gets to a point where flavor is taken from the barrel into the liquid, flavor is given from the liquid into the barrel, nice and circular, but the flavor has changed so much. Once the, once the rum is end of life, 
we get rid of it. Now, we're not throwing it away because it's a really lovely rum, but it will get sent all the way back to the Caribbean to get lost in a nameless rum blend, which, as I'm sure you'll agree, is quite literally a waste. So what we do is we take that rum, that becomes the base. Flavoring, banana peels, we all know banana peels. What do you do when you eat a banana? You get rid of the peel, right? Banana peels are almost a visual shorthand for the concept of waste, which is why I really like this. We work with a flavor house in the Netherlands. They make banana flavoring from the fruit. Previous to working with us, they were just discarding the peels. Now they dehydrate them, they grind them up, they send them to us. We steep them in alcohol, banana peel extract, add it to this, boom. We add sugar. We add sugar for two reasons. One, the rum that comes out of the cask was not designed to be drunk neat. If you get some of the master classes we did here last year, you guys would have tasted it. It's incredibly flavorful, but it's pretty fucking dry. Two, sugar is the great equalizer. It's important to remember, we're working with waste product. It's not designed with the same consistency in mind. So, a little bit of sugar. Plus, it tastes really good. Questions? Hold them till the end. Back to Alex. Um, so, I'll frame all of the talk we have about how Little Red Door works through with full awareness of all of the privilege that Little Red Door holds. We are incredibly lucky to be able to work in the way we do for a variety of reasons. One, we're in Paris. It's one of the most visited, if not the most visited, touristic city in the world. It has a high level of food and drink tourism, which means we have quite open and engaged guests. We're also right in the middle of France, one of the most diverse growing areas of Europe and one of the strongest agricultural heritage nations within Europe, if not the world. So the variety of produce we have is pretty great. Our ability to source it is not so hard and we have really lovely guests who are very welcome to it. And because we're Little Red Door and because of that 10 years of history that I mentioned, we have a lot of guests. And so making these decisions isn't a gamble or as much of a gamble as we would, we would, most bars would worry about. So we have 45 covers. If we're cheeky, we can get 50 in. We have 10 menu drinks. They're the 10 drinks you see in front of you. The only other drinks we offer is beer, a wine, and a, well, a red, a white, a rosé, and a draft beer. Draft beer we make with a local brewery. All of it is sourced from Ile de France. The wines, likewise, are all sourced in the Ile de France area. We do, this is actually a little bit inaccurate now. I would say that we're probably close to 500 drinks per night on average at the moment. Um, we have 95 to 98% of the drinks we sell are from our menu. That other 5 to 2% is classic cocktails that people order off menu. Very rarely do people do that. I'd say the two reasons for that is one, when you print a hardback book of your drinks and give it to someone, it seems a bit rude to then not order from it. Um, also, you wait from anywhere from half an hour to two hours to get into Little Red Door. Uh, if you spend all that time and then you come in and order your margarita with the brand you drink back in California, it seems like a bit of a waste as well. So most of the time, people give it. Also, Little Red Door, when I joined four years ago before COVID, was by far and away the busiest bar I've ever worked in my life. I moved from London. I've been there for five years. I remember ringing my ex-girlfriend at the time after work every day, and she was like, how was it? I was like, it's busy. Again, next day, it's busy. And after a week, she said, just stop telling me it's busy. I'll assume until otherwise said it is not busy. Um, and now we are over. This was made, this slide was made, I'd say, six months ago. We're now well over 120% growth before COVID. Is it a challenge? It's a very different challenge. Oh, I can't see it from here, that's why. Um, through this process, through these three menus, we've developed a network of producers that we work with. One of our big challenges and one of the focuses on how we work beyond you know, recycling, reusing, and reducing our footprint where we can was also to use this chain for better. We have built a network of producers, craft brands, uh, enthusiasts, guests, and other bars around us that support our ideals, and we channel that growth and that momentum into helping them financially, ecologically, in any way possible. Um, this photo, actually, some people, when you see it, they're like, oh, nice carrots. This is actually um, a really great example of why we work the way we do. Normally, in August, I start to receive photos from most of our producers going like, look how cool my crop is. Look how amazing it is. This was last August. 
This was um, one of our closest partners, Tom. He rose out outside of Paris in Normandy. And he sent me this photo because I don't know if many of you saw, but last year the world was on fire. Most of France was caught up in wildfires. We had rivers running dry. Uh, and the plants and crops were not able to cope. And the reason why this photo is quite symbolic is if you walked into a supermarket anywhere in Europe last summer, you would have seen the exact same thing you see now. You do not see the effects of climate change, global warming, whatever you want to call it, on producers immediately. You guys see it in five to ten years when those things stop existing or become exorbitantly expensive or the businesses that rely on them go out of business and there are no sources for it. Because of our model, we're able to position ourselves where we see immediately those effects and we're able to not only help address them, which is, goes into how discarded work, but also help create those narratives with our consumers so they're able to understand that before things become too late, before these issues are irreversible, and to better understand the nuances of those. For example, France, at one end of the country, is sinking into the ocean. It has too much water. Most of Normandy is sinking under the channel, like a lot of Holland. And the southeast, and especially the mountainous areas, are going dry. One country, the exact opposite problem. It's very easy to simplify these discussions to stop wasting your garnishes, stop wasting this. There's no simple solutions. We have to kind of, together, be closer to the problems to better understand them and to better address ourselves and the businesses we work in to address these. And there are no easy answers, and there's always going to be compromise. Like Sam said, it's not about being perfect. It's just about trying to be better. One of the ways we did this is that demand was incredibly difficult to do on 10 drinks. We found after two years of this growth, we couldn't do what we do and only have 10 drinks. The 10 drinks meant that we had to source too much produce. The amount of pumpkins we would need to make the pumpkin drink if we were going on just one menu of 10 drinks completely undermined the point. We would have had to source 500 kilograms to over a ton. No small producer makes tons of things. Small producers, by their nature, make small amounts of things. So all of a sudden, we realized that the success of what we were trying to do was undermining what we were trying to do. And so instead of just going, well, you know, that's the reality. We've created the product. Let's go with it. We stopped. Now, 25 to 30% of our revenue comes from a tasting menu that we offer every day. We have Monday to Thursday one booking slot, which is between 4 and 5 o'clock. It's an hour and a half experience. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, there are two. This is pre-sold. It allows us to take that revenue and channel it into our partners well in advance. So we're able to make down payments on produce that we want over a year in advance. And we're able to manage our cash flow a lot better while delivering arguably a more curated experience for our guests that is able to be more flexible to the demands of the producers in terms of seasonality. So unlike these 10 drinks, which exist anywhere up to 12 months, the menus here can last for a day, a week, a month, depending on how much produce we have and how well it's received. We've had to change our business model after 10 years just to accommodate our, our side. So like the point is more that you can't just have one good idea and go with it and say this is cool and it's box ticking. You have to be cognizant through that process of what you are doing and how it is impacting the producers in your supply chain, your guests, your staff, and everyone around you. So the first one I mentioned in terms of managing supply chains was, or season um, waste streams, was does it have any flavor? It's the most common thing all of you will have dealt with when you address the issue of sustainability, right? I have something, it still has flavor, but I've already used it once, what do I do afterwards? Myself and Sam have spoken many, many times about how sustainability should not be sacrifice. And I think the single greatest example of sustainability being sacrificed is mint stem cordials. They taste like shit, <laughs> they're so bad. And they're trying to be good and not delivering to yourself or your guest. What we try to work with is we try to use our model to extract and condense and concentrate that flavor in any ways possible. The main four ways from that is maceration. You, do one, uh, you use one product afterwards, infuse it into alcohol, strain it away, you've preserved it. The simplest thing in the world is how everybody has done preservation for years. You can also include with that curing. You can macerate in salts, pickling, in vinegars etc. Fermentation is a good one. It's not a perfect solution because things aren't stable. A lot of what we work with, because we work in such large scales and we work in concentration, so all of the produce we source is during the season at the height of the season. So when we order pumpkins, we don't order weekly. We order once a year. 
two tons of pumpkins turn up, and that's it. That means you have a lot of waste, which means you have to approach it very systematically, but it also means once you've done it, you don't want it to change or move, you want it to stay still and be good. Uh, distillation is another very classic one, infused into alcohol, but then the flavor isn't very strong or very palatable. Distillation allows you to concentrate that. Also may, along the way, allow you to remove other impurities and make it less stable. But the one that we use way more than I think anybody anticipates, and if anybody asks us what's the one thing we use the most in Le Dorador, is a rationale oven. We have a rationale oven. If you don't have a rationale oven and you're looking at building a lab, do not buy a Rotovap. Buy an oven. You don't need extraction for them. They can do anything. And they allow you to do prep, garnishes, anything you want in a scale that allows it to be humanly manageable. What we end up doing is using the rationale to extract the water content of most of the produce we work with if we either have no viable alternative in terms of maceration or distillation, or we just simply don't have the time to deal with it at that moment. It is energy intensive, but it means there is little waste. It is better to use energy to avoid waste than to not use any energy and allow the waste to go by and change and spoil or anything else. It also allows you, in most cases, if you want to be really lazy, you can blend dehydrated products into a powder, and that's exactly what we do with the pumpkin. Once we've dehydrated it, we blend it into a powder, and this is the base of the meringue. So then all you use is pumpkin powder, an egg, and a little bit of sugar, and we make a meringue from it. And that allows us, through the season, to keep consistently delivering a pumpkin garnish, which isn't going to go off. We can cook those at a temperature that it means that the egg will be stabilized, it will stay shelf stable, and will not become a health hazard. And it also means that for my team, I'm not asking them to do another thing again and again every single day. We can do it on a scale that matches our business needs, which I think when we're talking about all of these things that you can do, the most important thing to remember is it has to be deliverable. If you can't do it consistently, it isn't sustainable. And that a lot of what we've worked and figured out over three years by a lot of errors is consistency is way more important than perfection. Cool. This is the recipe for the pumpkin meringue. For those of you who have taken down the uh, PDF, you will have this forever. If you have any questions, you have my email and Sam's email and our Instagram handles. You can ask us any questions. The thing that says you need to like blend it to a certain point, that word in French translates to the bird's beak. And it's when you whisk a meringue and it goes like that. And if it flops off the end but doesn't break, it's perfect. If it stays upright, you've gone too far. If it flops down, not enough. So is that like a soft beak? Is that what you call it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yes. Yeah. Do you do it with egg whites? Yes. Is there an alternative or only Why do you need an alternative? Um, just for those people who want to go vegan and they maybe go for garden. So we can do that in small amounts. But we don't because, so I'm vegan. Most of the things you'll see here aren't vegan. Anything that we source, we stand by, for, the, for example, all of our eggs are sourced from our pepper producer. The chickens are a specific part of it, and we use that as a narrative to have that. Often as well, I think what's really important is when you make that choice. You, know, you could be a bar that says we, everything we do is vegan. That's a really great choice, really wonderful for the planet. There are lots of improvements you can make on that. One thing we talk about, though, is never confronting guests with compromise, but also presenting your product with confidence. So, for example, in this case, if a guest asks us that, we could, and you could do this with Aquafaba or whatever. Little Red Door, we don't offer an alternative for it. We don't put this on a menu where someone would be able to tell us our dietary requirements in advance, but on the general menu, we don't do that. If someone says, I'm vegan, I can't, we take it off. And we explain to them the reason why. So this, the chickens are from our pepper producer. They're a natural part of the life of the farm. They help irrigate the soil, prevent pests, and also provide a second source of income for the farms during those periods when they're not producing uh, produce, like peppers, for example. That's part of our narrative. If someone doesn't want to engage with it because of religious, personal, ethical choices, 100% their choice. Their money, their choice. But we confidently say, we'll remove it but we don't need to substitute it. That's part of our story. So far, as far as I'm aware, unless the entire team lied to me every day, we don't have negative response to that. Most people who hold those decisions closely understand when you present to them your decisions. It's normally the people who don't make those decisions who don't like being confronted with them, and none of our products should, in theory, do that. <laughs> um, That's a great answer. Thank you. 
Uh, this is Mary Lise. She is the scariest lady in France. Uh, she is one of two sisters who run Noir A Company. They are an AOP. Everyone know what AOP means? AOP, there are three levels of uh, certification of regional provenance in France. AOP is one of those. They all pretty much mean the same thing. Uh, AOP Valence walnuts are a protected uh, appellation of walnuts within France. Uh, they're incredibly historic. They are one of the best producers for us to work with because we've worked with them for three years and they really help us tell the narrative of how Little Red Door works. The garnish you have in front of you that is that is a fake walnut. The drink itself is, for me, the kind of crowning achievement, the pinnacle of Little Red Door's farm to glass approach. The drink in Little Red Door itself is only the, the last two ingredients. It is, oh no, the first and the last ingredient. It is a green walnut infusion into Mart de Burgoyne. Those of you who have ever worked with green walnuts know they come once a year, normally mid to late June. You have about a week to work with them. In Italy, the south of France, they make a lot of uh, bitter walnut liqueurs with them. We wanted to make a Noir Saint-Jean style product, which is a green walnut wine, but we wanted to put it on tap and make it somewhere between a spritz and a Lambrusco. Uh, we sourced all of this in one go. I got a phone call on the way to Roma Bar show last year. I was in Milan train station waiting to change trains and Sabine, the nicer sister, rang me and said, hi Alex, your walnuts are on the way. I was like, cool, 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 cool. What, what walnuts? She's like, yeah, the ones you ordered like nine months ago, they're ready, they're on the way. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. So like two days, they'll be there. Great. So within that period of about five days that we had to process them, we managed to source an entire cask of Marc de Burgoyne from uh, the lovely gentleman, uh, Matthew at Sabs. Uh, and we were able to source or procure an allotment of one vineyard in the southwest of France, entire allotment and harvest of that year is red wine from Languedoc, in case anybody's interested. The infusion went in within five days. All of the liquid was decanted. All 300 kilograms of green walnuts were processed by hand. If you flick to the next one, there should be a little... Oh, no. okay. Are you going? One more? Here we go. They were all processed, all macerated. They're this beautiful green color. And after about two days, they are jet black. Um, macerated for nine months. Within that nine months, we then procured the... Uh, allocation, which was 1,200 litres of red wine. That then got delivered at the end of the harvest because then they had to put the new harvest liquid in there. Uh, and then the drink itself is a blend of the two. So I currently have in stock 1,350 litres of Warner red wine. The version we're doing today also incorporates the Cascara uh, sweet vermouth uh, from Discarded. We wouldn't have been able to do, do any of that three years ago. When we first started, when we first started doing Grounded, we would have never been able to do that. From having the contact and the trust of the producer in the first place, the first conversation I had with this walnut producer was, can I get your green walnuts? And they're like, why would we sell you them? We don't know you. It's less profitable for us than selling walnuts, and it's a pain. It took two years of developing a relationship with them to actually get them to agree to sell it to us in the first place. We had not developed the relationship with crass producers, which there is a very clear benefit and uh, disadvantage of being a craft producer. The big benefit of being a craft producer is you can be a lot more agile. And so if someone rings you from Paris and says, I need 300 liters, they can get that to you very quickly. Um, and we wouldn't have been able to store over 1,000 liters of one drink that we weren't going to sell until 10 months later. All of that came from every single decision-making process from grounded to now was, how can we do this? Can we do this better? Okay, maybe we can't do it perfectly now, but what about in a month or three months or the next menu? And then not forgetting those commitments and not forgetting that commitment to progressing or trying to incorporate these things. And then the end of it, we have what I think is one of Little Red Door's best drinks. It's on tap, so guests get it super quick. It has no compromise on quality because we control every single ounce of liquid that is in every single glass. And really wonderfully, I can tell you not only where the money goes. I can tell you who. With three photos, I can show you the three people who make money from this drink. No one else. So I'll let Sam talk about Cascara. Thanks, mate. So, uh, yeah, I think there's some really interesting stuff around control and also development and also realizing that it might not be perfect today, 
how can we do it better? And I think so many of us, and this is a personal thing, it's a human psychological thing, you guys will be free with it. You're like, oh, I want to I do this thing, I want to change this thing, I, I want to start running. Oh, but I need to get all the gear first. And then, like, oh, I need a new smartwatch, and I need this, and I need that. And it's like, no, walk out of your house and walk around the block. Like, that is something you can do that's manageable, and then you look at how you can make it better. Uh, which brings me quite neatly, back to this picture again, uh, to our Cascara Vermouth. So hands up if you actually know what Cascara is. That's way more than I expected. It's good to know. Finally, so someone somewhere is banging the drum on Cascara education. Hands up if you know what Vermouth is. Is that less hands? That can't be right in a room full of... You guys okay? <laughs> uh, this is our sweet Cascara Vermouth. This was the first product that we launched. We launched this back in the distant wasteland of 2018. If anyone can remember what that was like. Um, the idea for this was actually created internally by one of our brand ambassadors, a guy called Joe Petch. Anyone know Joe? Joe used to work on Rekha Vodka at the time, but now he's now the global brand ambassador for Monkey Shoulder. One of his... Joe is, is a lunatic. He, like does build stuff in his shed, messes around. And one of his friends, a guy called Dan from a coffee roastery in Bristol in the UK, was like, you like weird shit, here's some weird shit. Gave him some cascara. Joe as a bartender loves anything fortified because you know we do because we're weirdos. So he experimented with infusing cascara with off the shelf vermouth. Thought it tasted pretty good and brought it to our innovation team at William Grant, which is the part of the business that I have the privilege of living in. And they were like, this this is pretty cool. What, what is it? What's cascara? Cascara is the discarded fruit of the coffee cherry. Discarded? Interesting. Maybe there's something there. What, what, what else is in it? Vermouth. Have we got a vermouth? No. Could we make a vermouth? Well, yeah, maybe. And so it was this idea of looking what we already had to hand and seeing what we could do better with it. Conceptual link back to what Alex was talking about. So, again... I'm going to go back to whiskey. As I said, whiskey get aged in barrels. Different barrels give different flavors, right? Something like 60% of all the scotch that's aging in Scotland is sherry cask. Now, whiskey goes in 8, 10, 12 years, however long. Whiskey comes out. Sherry goes into the barrel to reflavor. Now, who here buys sherry on a regular basis? I get expecting more hands. But basically, if I, in, in England, and hopefully I'm not offending anyone here, if I, in England I was to say no one really drinks sherry apart from your gran at Christmas, I'd say that's fairly accurate here, it's a very, 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 very tiny industry, right? Whereas whiskey, I think there's something like six million... No, it's, I, I don't know. There's a lot of car staging in Scotland. So there's no sherry knocking about. So what the whiskey industry does is we make our own sherry. Now, if you want to get really, really technical, it's not sherry. It's not from the Sherry Triangle in Spain. It's sherry-style spirit wine. It looks like sherry. It tastes like sherry. I'm just going to call it sherry because I can't be bothered to say sherry-style spirit wine every time. So what happens is they use this sherry to reflavor the barrels. Again, like with the rum, eventually the flavor of the sherry will change too much. Now, sherry industry, very, very small. Second-hand sherry industry used sherry industry, non-existent, right? So this stuff gets discarded, it gets thrown away. Because unfortunately, we live in a world where that is cheaper than finding something to do with it. A tiny little bit of it gets sold to the people that make sherry vinegar. But again, they don't want it because it has this really unique flavor. It's not just sherry. It's sherry that's been in and out of whiskey casks. It's been sharing this space with scotch. So... We looked around and we were like, well, we could make a vermouth out of that. What's a vermouth? Anyone? There are no wrong answers, apart from the wrong one. Yeah, you, sir. Yes, is a, more specifically, it's an aromatized fortified wine. So, sherry, wine. We take cascara, we turn that into an extract using neutral spirit. We fortify and we aromatize it with two things. We add cinnamon, because it tastes awesome in this flavor profile, and we add wormwood. Why do we add wormwood? It needs to have wormwood in to be called a vermouth. Vermouth is a French word, which is a bastardization of a German word, which is vermouth, which means wormwood, right? Nice. So that's the base, the sherry. What's cascara? As I said, cascara is the discarded fruit of the coffee cherry. 
For those of you that don't know, coffee is not a bean. We talk about the coffee bean. Endless coffee shops have names like Bean There, Done That, or Bean and Gone, or other such terrible puns. Uh, but coffee is actually a seed. Where do seeds come from? Thank you. If it has seeds, it's a fruit. This is why cucumbers are fruit. Peppers are fruit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ava yeah, if it has seeds, it's a fruit. So what we do is we process coffee in a few different ways that I'm not going to go into, but you are left with the seed and the pulp. The pulp, when dried, is called cascara, because it means dried husk in Spanish, I think. Now, millions of tons of this stuff are produced every year. Last time I looked, it was 14, 15 million tons. A tiny amount of it is used for fertilization, some of it is used for animal feeds, but most of it is discarded and left to rot, which again, literally a waste, because it has this incredibly unique flavor profile. It's like damsons, cherries, plums, banging. We take that, we turn it into an extract, use it to full throw the sherry, bit of cinnamon, bit of wormwood, and you get this, which is something really different. Like this is such a long way away from any other sweet vermouth I've ever tasted. It's not botanically, it's, it's not dry, it's not traditional. But it is absolutely delicious. And so it gives you something, as a bartender, I always found th the reason I worked with this before I worked for this brand, it was just a really nice way to do something different with vermouth forward cocktails. Um, hopefully you think it tastes great. Questions? Sweet, here we go. Uh, this is if for anybody who wants to understand Little Red Door's growth. This slide is very interesting to read through. It shows you we went from sourcing things directly from producers, ordering essentially things they already made, to ordering things that they didn't normally sell, that we had access to, to sourcing things that no one else can get hold of. Uh, the volumes of which Ev Warner developed was very representative of Little Red Door's growth, um, like I mentioned. We wouldn't have been able to do any of this at three years ago. This is a good example if you want to look back at the PDF later to really understand one we say, like the amounts, the volumes that we're talking about. But if we skip through to the next one. Uh, this is, oh, this is a nice one. This is the lab, if we go back one. This is the lab that we currently have on the left. I wonder if you can click on that and it will play. So um, the lab on the three on the left is the lab space we have now. It's a co-working space that we commandeered. When they launched, we guaranteed that they would have all of uh, this space and we said look you have two spaces we'll take one of them that will basically pay your bills keep your lights on gives us a space we want to work with we all knew that along the way this was a short-term solution for both of us and that short-term solution is coming to an end as of this week this is our brand new lab it is huge it's about 150 square meters it will incorporate a warehouse a lab and a office this is the beautiful office um, this is the growth we've needed to do now again and I say we're very, very privileged to be in France, the food lab that we were working in was funded by the French government, the city of Paris, and the EU. The lab we have just taken is funded by the French government, the city of Paris, and the EU. The rent is very affordable. Very affordable comparative to how much Little Red Door is. Now, when we're asked about the success of Little Red Door and what this means for us as a business, many times people ask us if we want to move to a larger site or open a second site. And it comes from this motivation that is incredibly not French, but very Anglo would be the polite way of saying it, which is growth is good. Growing and consuming more and doing more is always better. For us, we are very clear in that Little Red Door is Little Red Door. It will only exist in Little Red Door. We will never do another one and we will never push it beyond its means. Its growth, both outward and inward, will always be in balance. The talk that I do around Evergreen is called How to Care for an Apple Tree, which is based on the notion that if you try and care for a plant, it will push and pull in either direction. If it has too many roots and not enough leaves, it will grow upward. If it doesn't have enough support, it will push downward. And it doesn't matter what you put around the top or the bottom, it will push against it and try and break it. All companies, all living organisms are the exact same. So this space is necessary to do the volumes that Little Red orders. The most cost-effective way to do that is to find spaces outside of the city where rent is cheaper, uh, production is a lot more convenient, and is a lot more accessible. So it allows us to do this without ever having to put too much demands on the bar space that we have at Little Red Door, which we like to think of as an incredibly premium experience that we would not want to be sullied 
With, for example, in the first ever grounded menu, we had over two tons of produce come into the bar. And if you've ever seen over a ton of produce in real life, you will know it has no place in a bar. Cool. So uh, this is the recipe for the faux walnut. Maybe I've gone past the... Uh, here we go. So if it doesn't have flavor, but it has structure, one of the things that I said in that rate lab space that we'll have is a warehouse. One of the things that we are looking to do, because we are very uh, fidgety, is a nice way to say it, we can never stop doing more though. So when we say we don't want Little Red Door itself to grow and do more, uh, we do still want to do more with the producers we work with. For example, most of the producers we work with on this menu, we probably won't work with most of them on the next menu, nor did we on the menu before that and the menu before that. There's only three producers that exist in the three farm to glass menus we did. Everybody else rotated. But we still want to keep supporting them. Now, as Little Red Door, there's only so much volume we can push through, and so there's only so much people we can support directly from the operations of the bar. What we're building within this lab space is the ability to channel those connections, that creativity, and that capital we've invested into other businesses who want to either buy the product products we make from the producers, also just make direct-to-consumer products that people can engage with as well, and just create a facility that allows us to act as a hub for that activity. Like Sam said, a lot of the waste that goes into any product is its packaging. What do you put it in? One of the things that we do, if a product that we have has no more flavor, but has lots of structure, the last version that we did of walnut was a really good example. We pulled all the walnut flavor out, and as you guys know, nuts are very dense in protein, and they're very heavy. And so even if you take flavor out, there's still a lot there to work with. But we have no use for it. I can't give that to guests. It doesn't taste like anything. It's basically baby food. But we work with a, a studio called Threads. Uh, most of you will have probably seen their work if you've ever seen anything that Empirical do. Uh, Adrian, who is the owner and head of Threads, was the PhD student who created all of Empirical's mycelium packaging. Uh, he has moved back to Paris to work on that, and we work with him to create templates of products that will then be housed in mycelium fed on their products by product. So for example, if we were to sell a bottle of carbonated walnut wine, the packaging for that bottle would be mycelium fed on spent walnuts. We have tried loads of things. What I can tell you, nuts are good. Potatoes are good. Grains are good. Beetroots, carrots, and anything fleshy, really shit. Mycelium doesn't like it, has a strop, can't work with it. That is the other stream. This is Tom. This is the guy who sent me the photo of the carrots. This is him looking a lot happier later on in the year when things got a little bit cooler and the carrots got better. Uh, the melon drink that we have uh, is a combination of melon wine. The version that you guys are going to be trying uh, now and also later on has grape skin vodka. It ties in very nicely because the one in Little Red Door uses a direct source cognac. Um, and we use a little bit of verju. Now, melons for this um, are sourced from Normandy. Most people don't realize that you can grow exotic fruits very high in Europe. We actually found, so through Tom, we found someone who grew saffron two doors down. From that saffron producer, we found somebody who grew pineapples in Normandy. Um, pineapples from Normandy are, aren't the most impressive pineapples. They taste good. They look very pathetic. Um, but through that guy, we met somebody who was growing exotic fruits in Brittany, because he explained to us that for exotic fruits, yes, it's ideal to be hot and humid. But that's not the reason why most places don't grow them. The reason why you don't grow them is the same reason why the wine industry is having so many difficulties. It's fruits don't like being cold. They love to be hot, but they can survive in any condition unless they're cold because it kills them. It freezes the water in their cells and it breaks them and they can't grow very well. So mangoes, passion fruits, lychees, all of these fruits that grow in tropical climates can be grown in Europe, just not that well. Again, for us, yes, it would be lovely to get Alfonso mangoes from the most amazing growers all over the world. But French-grown alternatives may not be the best, but they're better. <laughs> and maybe when we support them, they might be able to grow more and help cultivate conditions that means that they can grow them better. And eventually on the way, maybe we'll have really great mangoes in France. Or maybe not, and we'll live without it. Um, the melon drink here that we talk about here, this is it. It's a really beautiful, very minimalistic uh, serve. Um, and the garnish for this is melon perfume. So on top of the drink, you will smell melon skin perfume. This is a good example of what we were talking about before. Does it have flavor? Yes. Is that flavor very strong? No. 
So we concentrate it. We work with a perfume, uh, a liqueur brand that works with perfumeries to concentrate the flavor. Um, we add in a little bit of the melon pulp. So you know when you peel a melon, you always get like a little bit of fleshy stuff on the inside. We use that to thin it out and dilute it. Um, and this acts as the garnish. And again, shelf stable, scalable, really easy to do in bulk. Allows us to reuse parts of it that wouldn't really have any value. Oh, that's the other thing. Mycelium doesn't really like fruit. Can't use melons. Um, this is also an example of where sourcing comes in. But I'll hand over because it overlaps really nicely with grape skin vodka. Thank you, sir. I, uh, I think one of the things that I've loved as we've worked together more and more is just how well you utilize your network. Like in everything from looking at how you can take that waste and turn it into mycelium packaging. Super interesting to, oh, we had melons, couldn't really get enough flavor out of them, so we worked with the guys that worked with someone that could. And like that is really interesting and something that I'm not really going to talk that much about today, but uh, feel free to ask me about it. We, we do a lot of work with teaching bars, restaurants, whatever, cafes, on how they can take their waste and turn it into something more interesting, right? How they can reuse it creatively. And the more we do this stuff, the more we find that it's the networks of communities where this stuff gets really interesting. Like, you're a cafe, you're making loads of coffee. For every kilo of coffee you buy, you throw at least a kilo of coffee in the bin. There's still loads of flavor, texture, and all sorts of interesting stuff in those used coffee grounds. So you can work with a bar down the road, turn them into syrups, liqueurs, cold brews, whatever you want. And then you have this really nice community bit. Juice bars, if you're looking for interesting fruit waste, full of it. They throw away bin bags and bin bags and bin bags of this stuff every day. And so that idea of using your network and working with a community is something that I think is really interesting. All right. Last one. Grape skin vodka. This is the latest addition to the discarded family. We launched this in, wait, what year are we in now? 23? Was this 22? Was this 21? I really don't know anymore. Um, we launched this kind of recently. Um, and this is a little bit different. So just as Alex was talking about, when we, we started the vermouth, we had this idea that we kind of fell onto of, okay, we've got this discarded base, we've got a discarded flavor, let's turn it into a liquid. And we elaborated that with the banana peel rum and we had a much clearer idea, right? It will come as no surprise to anyone that this, in all the markets we're in, is the top seller because it works and it communicates that waste flavor profile incredibly well. I say banana peel rum, hopefully most of you go, mm, sounds rather delightful. And when I'm like, yeah, it tastes like liquid banana bread, people are like, cool, give it to me. And then when they try it, they're like, fuck, that's great. Again, we had the rum in our supply chain. It's part of other parts of our business. And the flavor house that we get the banana peel rum from, we also get the cascara from now because it's just much more consistent than when we were buying it direct. Um, and we also work with them in other areas of the business. We get buy a lot of the botanicals we use when we distill Hendrix from them, right? So again, it's within the network. Now, as we started to look at what discarded was, in the future, we started to look at, right, well, we've kind of demonstrated that you can do this with the waste of the whiskey industry. Can we do it with something else? So we looked around, and after spirits, it's very easy to take a jump to wine. Now, again, if there's any wine people in here, I'm sorry. How do we make wine? We squish the grapes, we ferment the juice, we bottle the juice, we drink the juice, it tastes great. One of the byproducts of wine is something called pomace. Now, if we're getting technical, pomace is actually really any fruit waste that's a byproduct of making something like wine. But wine pomace is sticks, seeds, sorry, yeah, sticks, seeds, and stems. And skins, mainly skins, right? Again, out of all the wine that's made in the world, billions of tons of pomace are produced every year. Now, almost every single country that makes wine makes a grape skin spirit. Grappa. Guardienti, Cha Cha, Reiki, the list goes on and on and on. This is not those. The reason people make grapes skin spirits is grapes still have a tremendous amount of sugar left, so it's very, very easy to ferment and therefore distill them. All of those spirits I just mentioned and the ones I didn't mention are all typically made in pot stills and only taken to 50 or 60%, right? And also, like, there are some amazing examples of these products out there, but as I'm sure all of you know, You've been at a wedding somewhere on the continent and someone pulls out an unmarked plastic bag of their grape skin spirit, it's probably going to be pretty sketchy. 
This is a vodka. Why is it a vodka? What makes something a vodka? Anyone? No. It's a, very, it's a very simple but technical answer. Yes, man in the glasses. Yes. Good. Thank you. You'd be surprised how many people in the bar industry answer that with what it's made from. You can make a vodka from anything if it has sugar and you can ferment it, therefore you can distill it. Taking it up into the neutral spirit territory, 95% ABV and above, is what classifies something as a vodka, right? So people have made vodka from every, everything from fruits to vegetables to there's a company in the UK that makes uh, vodka from whey, a byproduct of cheese production. It has sugar, you can ferment it, you can distill it, there you go. They're called Black Cow, check them out, super cool. They're also the UK, one of the UK's oldest cheese families and the cheese is banging. So we take the grape skins, we work with the guys who produce them. So we work with a vineyard uh, to the west of Madrid. Is that still on? Okay. A vineyard to the west of Madrid. And yeah, when they harvest, they have the grape skins. They have the tech on site to distill them. They distill them. They put it in a big old tanker and sail it up to us once a year, right? The second ingredient to this, and the reason why I think it is so interesting, and hopefully those of you that have tried this will agree with me, is something called wine alcohol or wine essence. And this is what you get when you remove the alcohol from wine. Why would you want to remove the alcohol from wine? Maybe you're trendy and you want to make a no or low ABV wine. The reality is you probably want to set it in the market next door with a lower ABV because you pay less tax. It's not quite as sexy a story, but that's why it happens. The alcohol that's removed, wine alcohol or wine essence, is typically destroyed. Some of it is sold to the hand sanitizer industry, but a lot of it just gets binned because they don't have a use for it which is a shame because it is one of the most interesting things I've ever tasted on its own. It is literally the heart and soul of that wine. All the esters, all the volatile, aroma volatile aromatics, a lot of organic chemistry that contributes to texture are loaded with this stuff. So we take a teeny tiny little bit and we drop it back into here. And the end result is not a flavored vodka, but it's definitely a vodka with a little bit of flavor. <laughs> I've practiced that before. Um, not my first time. And uh, that, is, that is it on our three discarded liquids. I'm going to pass back to Alex. Nice picture there. Um, so this uh, ties nicely in. This is a final bit about how we work in terms of sourcing. This is, again, a bit of a story of a journey that we've gone on with the brands who we work with. Um, the key information there is highlighted. We source everything directly. 98% of the ingredients of Little Red Door's latest menu are sourced in bulk with no single-use packaging. Um, when I started at Little Red Door and I saw most of the brands we work with were based in France, I asked why we didn't go direct and everyone told me it wasn't possible. After three years, they're wrong. Um, it isn't straightforward and most of the brands who aren't able to do that we stop working with. We do not have a single contract within Little Red Door for anything that we give to guests. Anything that is served to guests is because we think it's great. In theory, everywhere you go should be like that. The reality is it's not. When facing the problems of how do we do these things in more meaningful ways, when the answer was, oh, we can't do that because the large brands who we work with can't do it, the answer for us to improve was to stop working with those brands. And we did this in what we hoped was a very tactful way, which we didn't cancel, we don't call out brands, we don't say these guys are horrible, look at the rubbish packaging, etc. We just politely tell them this is what we do and who we are. And if you want to engage with us and you want to work with the Little Red Door brand, show us what you can do. Show us what improvements you can make. Every single craft brand we did to that said, cool, let's do it. This uh, photo is from a lay-by uh, just outside Paris on the way to Normandy with the guys from Tronti Caront who is an independent bottle of, of Calvados. They helped us find Calvados producers and cider makers all across Normandy who are able to sort supply to us direct in bulk with no waste within the whole. So when I say no single use, it also means everything eventually ends up back at those producers. Um, all of the neutral grain spirit that we do a lot of this distillation, so Little Red Door makes anywhere up to 80% of the liquid we sell ourselves, whether directly with us or in collaboration with us. Um, all of the base of that is 100% organic, 100% French. At the moment, most of the spirit is grain. 
we are transitioning to fruit-based distillates because they are a lot better for the environment. However, getting them in bulk and consistently is a challenge at the moment. So the commitment is by the end of this year, we'd move over. Uh, all of the sugar we get is 100% organic beet sugar. We are also working on ways to replace beet sugars because while they are satisfactory alternatives, they are not perfect. Cool. So the last thing people ask is like, well, what if it doesn't have flavor? And what if it doesn't have structure? What do you do then, huh? And we say, we put it in the bin. And they're like, what? And they're like, yeah, it goes in the bin, it's waste. And that's a reality that I don't understand why everyone gets really strange about when they talk about being sustainable. Some things are not useful. Like, they're just not, they have no value. They are just organic waste now. But the world has a solution for that. Compost it. It is of no use to anybody else other than the planet now. So just make sure it does go to compost. So we work with a company called Les Alchemists. They're a very lovely company based in France. They work all over France and mainly in metropolitan areas where cities do not provide composting. You would be surprised to know, despite many of its progressive uh, programs, the city of Paris has no commercial composting facility. So we found a company that did it for us. And as alchemists along the way, they deliver everything by bike. They collect it by bike. Majority, if not all of their bike force, is people who were incarcerated during their youth. If you're incarcerated at any point in your life, your employability massively drops. If you are incarcerated during your youth, your likelihood of getting a job halves. Because not only have you got a criminal record, but you are removed from the educational system at a key point in your life and you are not able to gain the measurable skills that society deem are necessary to progress. Thus, those people are twice as disadvantaged, not to mention any of the other social economic uh, backgrounds that often are correlated to being incarcerated at youth. This allows us to support those people. We do that and we get 10% of all of the waste we produce. It gets collected twice a week. All of that at the end of the year, they count up. They also monitor to it for us what the waste is. Um, doing your homework on who you are as a business is incredibly important. It is timely, it is cost, uh, cost use, but that's a choice. Everybody who works in a business here, everything you do is a ethical choice. Whether you say it's your professional choice or not, whether you have control over it is a different matter. But everything you do is a choice. You choose where you spend your money, how that affects the world. If you choose to spend your time monitoring your business so you can accurately say who you are and what you represent, that is for us deemed a good use of our time. So we uh, monitor, we look back and see if there's any ways which we can prove, and then they normally they offer to give it to you back, um, but we have no use. We are a tiny bar in the middle of Paris. We have no use for compost. So we send it on to the producers we work with, and then it feeds back into that system. This is perfectly fine. Does that mean we want to reduce our waste? Yes. Does it mean we can stop all of our waste? No, we're a business. The reality is we live in the modern world. There are things that are outside of our control, but we try and find a solution for it. That dialogue and that narrative, and us also being able to say we're not perfect, we want to be better. If everybody within the bar community and every large brand was able to say that, the world would be in a much better place much more quickly than the state we have, we think, at the moment. So the final thing we do, with this, like I said, infuse it into alcohol, distill it. We work with a, a perfumery brand who allow us to basically balance this alongside a few other additives which are all sourced within our guidelines to create an aromatic that will out long, long last live uh, the melon drink on the Little Red Door menu. Pretty sure that's everything. Here's a little breakdown again for the PDF. It just tells you what we're doing, where we're going, how we're trying to do it. Uh, as you can see, we had a bar refurbishment, done. We are moving into our new lab space, tick. Uh, and the next step will be integrating more into the dining world. We do a lot of that when we travel. We work more often with fine dining venues than we do with bars because we find that our ethos and our way of working overlaps more naturally with restaurants and bars. So we're looking how do we accommodate that in our venue now to allow ourselves to be able to better cater the needs of the producers around us. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. The what? Ah, so you've got, the black one is a little, we brought some other parts uh, along from other drinks. The black one is a little cracker we make from olive tapenade. This is a really nice example, similar to walnut. We can't, when, when we buy once in a year, that's maybe convenient for us, but it isn't necessarily the most ideal situation for the producers we work with because we stop ordering through the year. The olive cracker is made from a tapenade that has no additives in it. 
that we add in um, to a cracker recipe. And that allows us to continuously source tapenade through the year from them, so we keep giving them business, basically. The cracker, like the glass-looking thing, is an isomalt, where once we infuse uh, the holy basil liqueur in the holy basil cocktail, uh, we wash the botanicals with water, we make a syrup out of it. It isn't as potent, but it still has flavor, and we add that into the isomalt to help create our glass. I'm not sure what else you have in there. Oh, you have citrus powder. We buy citrus leaves, we dehydrate them, we blend them with a bit of sugar, and we use that as the garnish on top of our citrus because we only get citrus during citrus season. Any other questions? Guy at the back. Huh? We, we don't. I mean, we don't have many fresh juices, and everything we get is organic and permaculture, so nothing has pesticides or anything else on it. Yeah, I mean, we, our solution is stop engaging with people who use pesticides. Just get better farmers, yeah. Yeah. normally. But pe pesticides and fertilizers are generally the sign of a badly, ma badly maintained environment for the fruits and vegetables. Most fruit and vegetables are healthy, are, have natural defenses against bugs and other issues. And so if you can maintain that, obviously you have some diseases. But outside of that, if you just maintain your land well, which is what most permaculture farmers do, you avoid the need to. Um, but yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think we, for fresh juices like that though, I mean there are loads of alternatives that people talk about acid blends and verju and we look for those but generally when we're putting together a drink, if you take for example a Garibaldi, we would then we look at that and break it down as well what is that experience for a guest, okay it has this round citric flavour, it has a viscosity, it has fluff from the orange juice, it has the Campari bitterness and then we write those down and say well how else can we do that? How else can we create that experience for the guests where we don't have to do those? Uh, for example, in our, we have a house whiskey sour. We don't use citrus. We use a very acidic cider. Um, what's great with that is because it's ever so slightly carbonated, it creates something between a sour and a fizz. So the guest experience is incredibly lovely because they're like, oh my God, look how fluffy it is. And they don't realize that it doesn't have that acidity. And to get back to the point we were talking about before in terms of you know, how we present this, we don't tell people that doesn't have citrus in. If they ask, we would be honest and say, yeah, we don't buy citrus. It's summer, mate. Like, of course there's no citrus around here. But it has cider in. That's quite acidic. If you don't like it, we'll change it. And we'll change anything. Pretty much in reality, Little Red Door's policy is like we don't do refunds and we don't do cancellations. Anybody asks us so they're not happy, they want to change it, we just say, cool. We'll give you your money back. If it wasn't an experience for you, we'll hope we get it right next time. And that's all right. So we, we have like a huge pantry of loads of molecular gastronomical ingredients. All of those are made in France. We source them directly. Are they perfect? No. Do we think they're a better solution? Generally, yes. Also, when we do get fresh citrus during citrus season, so in France from October to March, we source it. Uh, next year, we plan for the height of um, orange season in Paris, in France, where we get source basically from the Pyrenees. We will have one week where we will do on our, seat, our tasting menu, Garibaldi's. And probably six months later, we will do something with a homemade curacao made from all of the, all of the, the zest from that. But we have to plan that now. So, yeah. Yes.
I fucking hope so. <laughs> Is the simple answer to that. Um, yeah, so that you, there are, and again, Alex is a great person to talk about this, there are small batch producers that, because they have much more agility and flexibility, they're not bound by giant corporate machines, where they can. You can get bag and box, you can get corny kegs, there's loads of stuff. Typically, these guys are really struggling to make money. Like, we used to work with someone uh, in London called Victory Gin for doing events and stuff. You could get your gin and your vodka from them in five and 10 litre kegs, they went out of business. It's, it's challenging for small producers. Larger producers, like if you were like, Sam, can I buy a thousand litres of discarded grape skin vodka? I'm like, on paper, yeah. Like, I have the liquid, I can put it in a thousand litre ICB. I don't actually have the mechanic within the, the William Grant's way of working to actually sell it to you. I don't sell direct to people. I sell to route to markets and stuff. I have a lot of very frustrating, very boring conversations internally about how we can do this better. People that I really think are going about it the right way, although I think they're asking people to jump in too far, a company called EcoSpirits, I don't know if you guys have heard of them. That's a really good way of doing it. It's looking at what was already out there, like the pub industry is a good example of this. How is beer delivered, right? It's delivered in reusable kegs. It's transplanted into systems that already exist and it's quite normalized. I think one of the challenges eco spirits are having is that you're asking people to quite drastically change the way they operate. And like, yeah, if you look at an eco tote, it's a similar sort of size to a six pack of beer, a six pack of bottles, but six pack of bottles in small bars don't live as a six pack of bottles. They get decanted, they go on back bars, they go in rails, they go in wells. I think there's a reason why if you look at where eco spirits has been adopted, it's hotel chains in Southeast Asia who aren't space poor. I do genuinely think that sort of thing is the future. And, oh, sorry, I'm getting some time to wrap up. Yeah, so, yes and no, hopefully. One last question. You at the back in the hat, sir. Oh, yeah, probably. I mean, per Perno Ricard just bought a huge stake in Eco Spirits last week. So, people are doing it. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I've been Sam. This has been Alex. Thank you for coming. Come down to the grid bar tonight at 8 o'clock, where we will be serving full versions of the drinks you tried today. Mar 9 o'clock? 8 o'clock. OK, cool. And, uh, also, Marion and his team at the grid will be serving some fantastic drinks. So I hope to see you all there.